Today, Aston Martin are best known for making sleek V12 powered sports cars with swept back headlights and slippery aerodynamic shells. That wasn't always the case, however. For about 25 years, Aston Martin exclusively cut their trade on rakish V8 powered English muscle cars. Then, in 1992, a young designer called Ian Callum came around and changed everything. This Aston Martin DB7 is available now on shootingbrake.com, the car auction platform for enthusiasts. It's owned by a Drive Collective member and has a fantastic provenance to supplement those stunning lines. Before you bid, however, I'm sure you'd like to know what it's actually like to drive. Right, we've got an absolutely cracking start to day here because we're in an Aston Martin, which, I mean, it's just already brilliant. And then uh, it's a DB7 Volante on a sunny day, which is, again, great. But more than anything, this is the V12 version. So the DB7 was launched with a straight six, supercharged straight six derived from the Jaguar XJR. They then developed a 5.9 litre quad cam 48 valve V12. And this was the first application for the engine. That engine then became Aston Martin's core engine. It went on to power the DB9, the DBS, the V12 Vantage, all sorts of bona fide Aston Martin natural acid V12 sports cars but this was the very first application of the engine and it is an absolutely brilliant one as well. So as usual, I'm gonna tell you what this thing's like to drive. I'm gonna tell you what the chassis feels like, what the engine gear was like, etc., etc. But before that, I just wanna talk about what this car is and what it isn't. Now, this isn't a, you know, out and out bona fide sports car. It's not a Porsche 911 or a BMW M3. It's a GT. First and foremost, this is a GT, but it's still an Aston Martin. So we would expect some decent sporting credentials from it. When you, get into this car, every single surface you touch is covered in Conley leather or Wilson carpet. That is incredible. That is absolutely incredible. As I said, we have the very first application of the Aston Martin 5.9 V12 in this. And it is breathing through Aston's very own, quite free-flowing exhaust. So listen to this. Oh, that is just brilliant. So, okay, let's break it down piece by piece. Now, first things first, we have an automatic gearbox. And I can hear you groan, but it does suit this car. This is a GT, it's not an our sports car. But that gearbox is a ZF 5HP30 gearbox, and it's absolutely brilliant. It's the same gearbox used in the E38, 750i BMW, and 850i BMW. I had this gearbox in my own early 740i, which briefly came with this. It's a great gearbox. The gearbox logic is great. The shifts are crisp and smooth. It shifts when you want it to shift, it kicks down when you want it to kick down, it holds gear in sport mode. And best of all, bear in mind, this is way before paddles and stuff became common. We've got steering wheel controls for the gearbox. So to activate that, you're an automatic, you put the gearbox in sport mode, you nudge the selector up or down to activate the manual mode, and then you can then shift on the paddles. And then right where you want it to be as well. So you can then hold the car in gear, at which point it's effectively a manual listen saddle popped there from the V12. So second gear, the pull is absolutely ridiculous from that 48 valve quad cam V12. We've got 420 horsepower on offer here, so much more than what the competitors had to offer on this. The SL600 R129 was 394 brake and even heavier than this. And the BMW 850 style was 320. So 420 horsepower made this car an absolute hot rod when it was new. And it still does now, spins because the mid-range pull from this engine is absolutely brilliant. You've got amazing power from about 2000 RPM onwards and it pulls all the way to the red line, at which point the gearbox crisply shifts to the next gear. This is an engine that will definitely not leave you complaining. And hot rod is the right word because it very much feels that you're buying an engine with the rest of the car attached to it which is the same thing Enzo Ferrari said about his original V12 sports cars. It's a great feeling, I'll tell you that, and the engine is worth the price alone. So, you've got the gearbox in sport mode, got manual shifting on the steering wheel, and you got used to the power delivery of the engine, the fact that it's rear wheel drive, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you can start to explore the chassis and the steering a bit more. Now, I know what you're thinking, this is a almost two ton convertible, it's an Aston Martin. This was before Aston Martin started taking a more sporting, you know, approach to their cars. It's probably gonna be a barge, right? Well, in fact, I'll actually say it's actually surprisingly good down a B road. When you're driving this around town, you can relax, you know, let the automatic gearbox waft you along, etc., etc. But when the going gets tough, so let's just get this into, let's lock it into second gear on the paddles. Got a nice little corner here. 
really nice turn in there. That pull is absolutely incredible. Getting third. Undulating, off camber, fast sweeper there, and it takes it with absolute aplomb. The chassis setup on this is brilliant. It's not the stiffest of chassis out there. That's fine, it's to be expected as 25 or convertible, but the damping has been set up accordingly. It's quite soft, you get a bit of body roll, and you can feel the grip build up down the side of the car. The steering and the damping are both set up sympathetically for the chassis rigidity we have on offer. What that means is it's a beautifully composed car, it's really confident inspiring down the average British B road, which is actually a surprisingly home territory for this car. Also, just listen to that noise. I mean, oh, you're not gonna get bored of that anytime soon, are you? So the chassis setup, surprisingly neutral. You don't get a huge amount of understeer, really. And it, I get the feeling that if you were to overcook it in this, you'd kind of pitch the car into a gentle four-wheel slide. It's a very, very neutral, uh, very drive-oriented chassis balance. Aston Martin clearly have a lot of confidence in their, in their clientele. And if you dig deep on the brakes, you'll get neutral understeer. If you dig too deep, you will get the rear starting to pitch around, which, again, it's not onerous, it's not twitchy. It's just a nice feeling. It means you can, you do get some chassis adjustability in there. Uh, which is again surprising, so surprising for a car like this, a kind of quite heavy, quite big GT. Now the biggest surprise, the biggest surprise is the steering. So I was expecting extremely numb, extremely light, extremely slow steering. Instead, we've got a fairly quick geared hydraulic rack, not too quick, but quick enough. And it's full of feel. It's dancing around in my hands. Oh. <laughs> oh my God, this is one of the most surprising cars I've ever, ever driven. That is ridiculous this is genuinely the last thing i was expecting to do in this car is to have <laughs> really quite a lot of fun down the b road um but i suppose this was the the turn of aston martin's fortune they had a new body shell design new design language and apparently a very good chest test as well the the combination of the steering and the damping and the excellent mid-range in the engine means this is an eminently usable car and it delivers an Aston Martin sporting experience that is worth paying for. It doesn't disappoint. Wow, what a surprise. What an absolute surprise for a car. And then when you're rolling through town, not a gearbox into automatic, and it's completely tractable, it's quiet. You've got some presence from the engine there, which is really nice. And you just waft along. When it comes to duality of character, that is very hard to beat. And a great example of that duality of character is the brakes. So the brakes are humongous. They completely fill up the uh, eight inch wheels. I believe we've got six pot monoblock calipers there, drilled and vented. And yet the pedal, and I want to clarify, the pedal isn't spongy, but it's a very long travel pedal, extremely long travel pedal. So it's, there's no dead zone. You get braking force from the second you touch it, but the length of pedal and the progressiveness of it makes this a very relaxing car to drive around town because you can, you can decide exactly how much you want to slow down by. You can skim on the brakes to kind of, you know, get the car slowly pitched up to red light. And it just makes it so easy to just waft along and kind of chauffeur yourself around. But when you're having fun down the b road like we were just earlier, they stop so effectively. And you've actually got a surprisingly aggressive ABS setup. It'll almost let the fronts lock up before the ABS kicks in, which means you're getting the maximum possible threshold braking from this. Again, really impressive stuff. They didn't need to do that. They didn't need to give it brakes that were that effective. They didn't need to give it steering that was that effective. None of their competitors did. BMW didn't do it with the 850 and Mercedes didn't do it with the SX600, but Aston Martin wanted to give it just a step above and they gave it bigger brakes than Ferrari gave the 456. They gave it better steering than BMW gave the 850. Just, wow, what a surprise. And that, that's really what you're paying for. Aside from the interior and the looks, you are actually paying for genuine engineering capability. You're paying for genuine driver focus, genuine driver engagement, really well set up controls. <laughs> what? Genuinely, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. I wasn't expecting, I've always loved the DB7 for its looks and for its general feel, but I wasn't expecting to like how it drives, but I really, really do. It's just not a car that reveals itself to you instantly, but it's still really, really great.
Now, flaws or shortcomings, well, it's quite cramped in here, it has to be said. But I do fit, you know, I'm, I'm six foot, my head just about fits underneath the roof. I'm looking down the sculpted bonnet, which is no bad thing, really. And the visibility is great. My left leg could do a bit more space, but I do have a dead pedal. That transmission tonnet is very big, it has to be said. I'm not sure why it's so big, but it is. But the small steering wheel means leg access is very easy and general ingress and egress is great. The DB7 in the past was criticised for using, you know, parts bin, switch gear, etc. And yes, we've got Mazda MX-5 door handles, we've got Mazda 3T3 taillights, fine. But how often do you spend thinking about the taillights or door handles of your car? Let's be honest here. Really, the important things are that V12 engine, the Conley leather inside, and that stunning, stunning Ian Callum designed body shell. Oh, which in my opinion is one of the nicest, nicest designs Aston Martin ever made. This is the genesis of the modern Aston Martin format and design language. This set the tone for the Vanquish, the DB9, DBS, and, and all of the fantastic Aston Martin cars that we enjoy today. This was the first one to set that template. Just what a lovable car as an object, you know, what a lovable car. Not only does it fulfill a fairly decent use case of being a genuinely sporting GT, but as a thing to own, even if you were to never drive it, to be able to have an Aston Martin in your, in your garage with that V12. I mean, it's like having a, a powerboat or a Rolex, you know, or something like that. It's just such a nice thing to own. So yeah, overall, I mean, yes, you know, it's, it's genuinely great to drive and lovely to be in, perhaps a bit cramped, but more than anything, this just feels special. It feels unbelievably special. And it feels special from the second you start up and hear that glorious, glorious cold start noise. To the moment you roll out into town, doing 20, 30 mile an hour with this stunning automatic gearbox that's perfect for wafting. It just feels so special. And the best thing is being an Aston Martin, people let you out junctions because everyone loves an Aston. Everyone loves an Aston. And with the Volante, I mean, this is possibly one of the best ways to enjoy the English countryside out there. I, I, I can't think of a better way to do it. Maybe on a horse, I don't know. Right, so you've heard that the DB7 V12 Volante it's actually a pretty decent steer down the country lane, surprisingly so. And obviously it's a fantastic GT. It's got super long gearing, so it cruises at 2K at 70 and uh, 3K at a ton if you're in Germany, obviously, theoretically. Um, engine sounds incredible, incredible. It's not a uh, sonorous high pitch 12 it's a very powerful sound. Uh, it's just a dominating sound. Like, it's really hard to describe. It's just got loads of presence. Presence is the right word for it. Um, and every now and then you get a little pop in the exhaust a little bit over on, which is so characterful. Not like modern cars, it's very subdued, very subtle, but really, really great. Anyway, the point is, great engine, great chassis, great GT. But the other thing is, this is a very, very nice way to get around town. So first off, being a Volante, you get to experience the views around you. We're on Tower Bridge at the moment. The sun's out, I mean, what could be better? You've got an iconic British car from an iconic British brand on an iconic British bit of architecture and infrastructure. That is just fantastic. It's genuinely, this is a fairly decent car to live in. It doesn't want to be rushed, I will say that, because you've got a tonneau cover for the um, convertible roof. And just generally speaking, you know, it's not quite you want to jump into and just set off straight away. In. But as a thing to save, as a thing to enjoy, it's a very, very nice object to have. The one criticism I have around town, it's got quite a poor turning circle, not a lot of steering lock, and there's quite large overhangs. So you do need to be careful when you're maneuvering it but it's not an onerously long or wide car and it makes all the difference. It's just a really nice way to interact with your city and the people around it. And on top of that, I'm not necessarily someone who looks for it, but it just gets, gets a ton of positive attention. Yeah. What a way to travel. Honestly, what a way to travel. This is like a first class on an airplane or, or you know, commuting on a speedboat. It's just uh, absolutely brilliant. And the other thing about the kind of round town cape of this car, again, the engine and gearbox calibration is fantastic. Very talky V12, the ZF gearbox mapping has been oriented to make use of that. So you're just constantly loping around at idle, basically, which makes it really relaxing to be in. On top of that, damping is great. Got massive speed bumps here. Rides over them with a plum, as motion journalists say. But it really does, it really, really does. You get the feeling that Aston Martin didn't make this car with one specific single-minded use case. Instead, they just wanted to make a very good all-rounder that does everything fairly well, whilst also feeling extremely special as a kind of thing to hold in your hand. And I think they've executed that fantastically. Really, really fantastically. 
Anyway, this car is coming live to Shooting Brake on auction. Shooting Brake is an online auction platform. We've got over 100 detailed photographs of the car on the site. A very detailed description. Buyers can bid in confidence knowing that the car is going to be as described. If you do wish to view it, you can request so on our Q&A section where you can also ask questions about the car and the seller will respond accordingly. Uh, this car is owned by a member of Drive Collective. Drive Collective is a members club for Petroheads in London and surrounding areas. It's a very selective club that relies on owners of good character with interesting cars. You buy a car from Drive Collective, you know it's going to be a good one. And this Aston Martin DB7 V12 Volante is no exception. I really enjoyed driving this DB7. As a car, it's great, capable and fun enough on spirited drives, but as an object, it's utterly brilliant. Interacting with it gave me this sense of wanderlust that was almost akin to exploring the boundless grounds of a National Trust castle. The combination of brute force power and charming anachronisms creating an experience like no other. Now I could argue that you should buy this car over Mercedes SL600, BMW 850ci or various different Bentleys, and you really should. But that's not the point. You don't need a reason to buy an Aston Martin. You just do it because you want it. You do it because one day, when you walk down to your parking spot and blip the key, you want the lights of an Aston Martin to light up. You want to slip into that Connolly leather seat, put the unmarked red starter button and hear 12 cylinders bark into life. As you hear the rev settle into that laconically low idle, you'll realize that in an Aston, the wonderless starts the second you get behind the wheel.